and welcome to this year's Cybos Saturday on the World Payments Report from Capgemini. My name is Brian Kaplan, editor of The Banker, and I'll be chairing the panel discussion. Now, for obvious reasons, this year's session is online, but we aim to be as dynamic, as incisive, and as thought-provoking as if we were in Boston in front of you, our live audience. And the COVID-19 pandemic has thrown up many big challenges for the payments industry. We're going to explore those now with the help of an excellent panel. And as we're very tight on time, let me get straight down and introduce the panel. So first of all, we have our banking representative, Mark Budenheck, who's head of transaction services, commercial banking for ING. Then from the European Payments Council, that's the industry body that focuses on harmonization of electronic payments in the SEPA or the single Euro, Euro payments area, we have the Director General, Etienne Goose. And finally, we have someone who's very familiar to you from our host, Capgemini, Christophe Bernier, who's Cards and Payments Practice Leader at Capgemini Global Financial Services. Welcome to all of you. Uh, thanks for joining the panel and welcome to our online viewers. So we have three items on the agenda today. The first is we're going to look at the impact of COVID-19 on the payments industry, the resurgence of multiple risks and how to overcome them. Secondly, the EPI is an opportunity for European banking industry and how it's going to stay ahead in the business. And thirdly and finally, the need to engage in technology transformation by designing and implementing future-proof payment hubs. So if we start on that first point, the impact of COVID-19 on the payments industry. And I'll come to you first, Christoph. Um, obviously, it was all a, a shock to all of us, uh, but how well prepared do you think was the payments industry to handle something like this that came straight out of left field? And how did it cope with the pandemic, do you think? So Brian, first, uh, happy uh, to meet you uh, one, one more year, one year again. Uh, on, on this COVID pandemia, what I would like to say is first that nobody was really prepared uh, for such a, a pandemia. However, three bullets. Uh, the first one is that payment services that were already uh, mainly digital and automated have not experienced any uh, disruption of service across the globe. Uh, a few institutions uh, within, within banking and especially within corporate banking have realized that they were still relying uh, somewhere on uh, paper-based and, and manual processing for high-value payments, salary payments, sometimes for checks. So they've had to design uh, backup solutions, backup uh, processes on, on the fly. It worked, they were able. And, and lastly, uh, communities like, like the French community were able to adapt their offerings to market requirements, like increasing uh, the maximum amount for contactless card payment to 50 euros, as happened uh, across Europe, in very short timelines, uh, in spite of the uh, multiple uh, stakeholders involved. Uh, so, so overall, the industry responded. You give them a fairly good report then. Yeah, you so give, we developed give them high marks. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, okay. and, and probably uh, Mark uh, can comment about similar experience within his exactly. institution. Yeah. Let's get to Mark because obviously you're a practitioner uh, working for a major bank. Um, I mean, what measures did you have to take ING to cope with, with the pandemic? Yeah, um, of course, uh, with operations also in Asia, uh, we saw the, uh, the working from home mode uh, starting actually there already in uh, February. Um, and as COVID reached the uh, EMEA shores, uh, the decision was taken uh, somewhere in the middle of March, I think it was the 12th or something, to really split operation and, and start working from home for the entire uh, ING family. Within three weeks, we moved from uh, employees uh, working uh, occasionally from home to uh, 80 and sometimes even in certain areas, uh, 90%. Um, and the first measures, let's, let's also be clear, we're talking here about payments, uh, but the first me measures were, of course, for ensuring our business continuity. Um, uh, maintaining employee customer safety, that was the main, uh, the main goal uh, over it. We immediately started to uh, focus on, uh, of course, on payments, which is one of the critical processes uh, of a bank. Um, we started to monitor the uh, availability, the usage of the ATMs, which was actually a, a request by the ECB, so that cash would remain accessible. We've introduced uh, a change freeze uh, for the first couple of weeks, uh, not to risk anything. Um, quickly, requests from supermarkets uh, came in for uh, 
the need to come up with uh, solutions uh, for not touching anything while paying. Um, I guess all across the world, we've all increased the minimum amount to pay contactless uh, without typing in your PIN code. And it's uh, remarkable that this has been done in a week, where normally uh, with all the talks and the commissions around it, it would probably take, uh, take months. So from, so from what you're saying, I mean, you've, you've obviously, there was a huge number of, you know, sort of, you know, big initiatives here that were done very quickly, you know, uh, supermarket uh, measures, working from home. I mean, yeah. uh, it must have been a very full on period for you uh, going through all that. No, it was. And, and, and actually, it was remarkable uh, how fast this actually uh, uh, went. And part of this, I guess, is also to thank about uh, 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 thanks to our, let's say, agility that we had in the organization with people working agile. So we're, we're more or less, we were, let's say, prepared to do things fairly rapidly. And, and I must admit, a huge compliment for our IT guys. Uh, sometimes we complain about our IT guys, but in this case, uh, they managed to get, uh, let's say, basically the whole population within a few weeks uh, completely being able to work from home. They shipped laptops, desktops, uh, expand the remote access. We had to ship Wi-Fi, uh, especially to our people in India and the Philippines, uh, where if we go home, we have Wi-Fi. If okay. these people go home, they don't. Okay, let, 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 me, let me now move to Etienne. And, you know, I mean, it, is that uh, kind of story that we've heard from Mark, would you say that was uh, typical of every bank in Europe or would you say that, you know, we've seen different banks struggle in different ways and respond in, in different ways? I mean, how, what's your assessment of, of how European yeah. banks... Yeah. Actually, what we've seen across Europe confirms what uh, Christophe and Mark said. Uh, we've seen exceptional resilience on the part of both the payment service providers, the banks uh, by and large, and then infrastructures. And uh, they were able not only to keep the ecosystem up and running smoothly and safely, but also to uh, support a changing, uh, rapidly changing payments mix due to uh, COVID-19. On the other hand, I can also report that uh, for new initiatives, we've seen few delays in banks' ability and willingness to continue working and uh, implementing new things, even though here and there we've seen some delays that probably were due to uh, COVID-19 partially or indirectly. But so I think the, the report, the marks are high. Okay. All right. Now, look, Christoph, normally when we do the World Payments Report, you know, we talk for a lot of time about the, the growth in non-cash transactions. And normally you have, you know, lots of figures and graphs about the spectacular rise in non-cash transactions. Uh, we're a bit tight on time now, so 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 please keep it brief for me. But, you know, uh, first of all, how will the non-cash non transactions, <laughs> if I can say it, going before we had the COVID-19 pandemic and what do you expect to be the, the, the kind of impact in the long term on it? Brian, uh, our readers will find usual numbers in the report and on our website www.worldpaymentsreport.com. Uh, the, the, the key point we can bear in mind is that, uh, as Etienne was mentioning, uh, resilience and agility uh, are the two pillars for uh, creating, uh, for growing uh, the consumption of digital services. And uh, as we've been reporting two-digit growth in the, in the last year, uh, growth in, in volume, in number of transactions is accelerating. And without COVID, we were predicting a 16% growth until 2023 and hitting the trillion, hitting the trillion transaction by 2022. COVID okay. has COVID has a, a negative and positive uh, effects that don't totally compensate. Um, so the negative effect is an obvious uh, lockdown during one quarter with people spending less, huh? uh, and then and then we'll we'll have an economic downturn with probably a two-year recovery. Um, so we've we've taken. Uh, this uh, negative impact on our uh, projection balance slightly with an accelerated adoption of digital payment in some areas, uh, like people that were reluctant to uh, using uh, uh, contactless payments or like the small middle market and, and professionals moving to e-commerce because their shops were, were closed. Overall, it will cost one year 
more or less. So the trillion will be reached in 2023 instead of 2022. But uh, this difference hits the regions differently. In other words, in uh, Asia, where growth was huge, the impact will be irrelevant. In the US, uh, probably US will have no growth uh, over the next uh, two, three years. And uh, again, it will uh, uh, consolidate the Asian leadership on, on payments for coming years. Okay. Very in payments good. like in other areas, by the way. Okay. Very good. Yeah. I mean, as you say, I mean, there's lots and lots of figures still in the report as normal that people can, can get hold of and analyze at their leisure. Now, well, let's move on now to an initiative that was scheduled long before anyone had ever heard of, of COVID-19, and that's the EPI, European Payments Initiative. Uh, Mark, I mean, ING is a founder member of the EPI. So can you perhaps just give us a little bit of a kind of uh, background on what EPI involves how it will work and when it will all become operational. <laughs> uh, you're asking a lot of questions at the same time. So yes, we are one of the uh, banks that is in, involved in uh, the European Payments uh, Initiative. Um, uh, we see EPI as an opportunity to make the European payments landscape, landscape less fragmented. Um, yeah. And if successful, uh, this will enable consumers to do P2P payments with any other European consumer, pay at any online or regular merchant here uh, in Europe. And that's presently, at present, this is absolutely not the case. It's still extremely fragmented. Ideal, very successful in the Netherlands, Jarocard in Germany, Bizum in Spain, but you cannot pay with uh, uh, a card in the Netherlands or with Ideal in whatever kind of uh, country. So we think that by leveraging the best practices, we hope to design, uh, and I really think we, should, we need to go there, uh, the best in class online in-store and P2P payment solution, uh, and hopefully enabling Europeans to pay anywhere in Europe, whether online, in-store or whatever. That's the goal of uh, API. Currently, we're in the process of, uh, and I think actually this happened uh, uh, last week. Uh, the company has been created. Uh, everybody deposited their contribution. Uh, we're in the process of uh, gathering the people, the leadership in the company uh, to start working on the design. That should be finalized in the course of uh, the first half, I think, 2021. And then the team needs to start working and they have a very ambitious uh, time schedule. Um, I'm not going to reveal it right now. I leave that up to the yeah. leadership of that uh, team, but there's really a push to do this fast. Okay. All right. Let me go now to, to Etienne. I mean, I, when I introduced you, I said, you know, the EPC was all about uh, making SEPA work better. Uh, I mean, do you see the EPI as assisting with that? And uh, uh, I mean, in that overall goal that you have of sort of harmonization? I mean, are we seeing enough enough of these kinds of collaborations between different countries? Yeah, I, I think SEP by itself and the EPC and what it does are clear evidence that actually uh, there is successful pan-European uh, cooperation and uh, and harmonization. And the latest example is the INST. And I think EPI is another example of uh, where that could uh, indeed lead in the same direction uh, if, uh, because API seems to show that uh, national banking communities are able to agree on the same vision, on the way to implement it, even if it costs a loss of uh, national control, and if it implies uh, abandoning or ch changing national habits, uh, uh, yeah. schemes or, or procedures. Uh, so I think um, this is clearly uh, Another example, of course, as Mark was saying, this still needs to materialize. There is one more thing that I would like to add, to be fair. I think we shouldn't underestimate the role of uh, public authorities pushing uh, the industry and also the absolute need for me, it's a key uh, success factor of involving other stakeholders, especially the end users. That's for me a recipe for long time success of such initiatives. Okay, so so this is obviously clearly something where we have seen good cooperation. Uh, but Mark, more generally, I mean, do you uh, think that there's sufficient co cooperation between the different countries in the in the SEPA area to to lead to harmonisation in in financial services? I'm sorry, I I didn't catch a question uh, actually. Uh, I, I said I said the, the EPI was a 
is a good example of uh, of collaboration between different countries yeah. and banks, really, uh, to make uh, smooth payments work. Uh, but I think I was thinking more generally. Uh, do you think there's sufficient collaboration between the the SEPA countries uh, in order to make you know financial services harmonised as we need to see for a, a, a Euro payments area? I think if if you're asking me if there's more ground to cover uh, uh, in this, it's absolutely uh, one of the biggest things. Uh, 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 that we're facing right now, and, and that's been accelerated also by the COVID crisis, is, uh, uh, for instance, a standard EID, um, where you can clearly, simply identify people uh, in in a similar way across the different countries. And that's also where regulators have to play a role. It's not only, let's say, the role of banks to uh, to work together on different elements, but it's also the role of regulators to help us to harmonize the landscape of regulations. Um, and, and let's say the recent introduction of PSD2 in Europe is also one of those uh, examples where, where you see that Patient per country per regulator differs slightly from one to another, and that causes, if you want to create Europe, and, and in, in to quote somebody, to make Europe great again, we need to eliminate all these little differences and be extremely consistent in the way we interpret laws and we uh, put laws in place so that we can really create that single European experience. Okay, all right. Now, I'm very pleased you, you raised regulation there because I wanted to, to bring that up. And uh, uh, Christoph, I mean, we, we often talk in the uh, WPR, and, and this year is no different, you know. I mean, we have our krills uh, about sort of key regulatory initiatives about regulation. And often we've said in the past, you know, the focus for regulators has been driving innovation. Um, is this still the case in your view, or has the whole regulatory response to the pandemic uh, changed the, the approach of regulators now? So in, in recent years, we've been clustering the regulatory uh, initiative uh, in uh, those that uh, uh, aim at uh, containing, managing risk, uh, so bring confidence to the market, and, and those uh, aiming at fostering uh, innovation. Uh, so we, we've updated that in, uh, in the report. This has not changed. Uh, COVID, to be honest, has marginally uh, so far uh, changed the regulatory agenda. Uh, COVID is an accelerator, but the key drivers for change were already there, and the key regulatory initiatives uh, to support the, uh, the industry and, and protect the, the consumer were already there. So marginally, we'll have a, uh, regulate new regulation on QR code, contactless schemes. We've commented about EP, EPI. This is on the innovative front, innovation front. On the risk front, we've, we learn more from Wirecard than from uh, COVID probably, uh, where uh, the way uh, local uh, uh, local control authorities huh, and the licensing authorities. Um, uh, manage their uh, portfolio of uh, of, uh, of institutions uh, will have to uh, be enhanced and harmonized. I was still last week with a, uh, a European bank willing to create a payment service provider and asking through which countries they should uh, go uh, uh, ask for a license. Uh, it should be the same uh, through uh, through yeah. all of them. So uh, we'll have a few uh, topics on uh, on on risk. Um, but this is a nutshell. Would you say that the pandemic has moved the regulatory focus a little bit from innovation? A little bit more on risk, definitely. Okay. definitely. All right. Well, let, let me take that to Mark now because um, I mean the report, the, the WPR report reveals, you know, the payments firms have to grapple with increased risk across business regulation and operations. In fact. In the survey, 87% of executives said they face a high likelihood of cyber vulnerabilities. I mean, is that, is that also your reading? Uh, more concern about uh, cyber attacks um, and, and other kinds of risks are now to the fore. Yeah, what you what you what you can see if 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 the world becomes more digital and and people who previously did not uh, act uh, digital, that will of course increase let's say the uh, 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 the risk. Um, 
what we actually see is that um, cyber criminals uh, uh, really stayed up to date, but they used existing methods to, uh, let's say, they rebranded their common phishing and smishing uh, tactics to a COVID theme. And so instead of uh, talking about uh, uh, regular uh, changes in the household, they now talked about you need to refresh in your debit card because of COVID and please send it to the bank. Uh, that's that's the kind of specific things that we're seeing. The, so the methods have not actually changed, but have we talked about agility in the beginning and we think we're pretty agile. I can tell you the criminals are agile uh, as well. And that forced us to um, uh, set up a special uh, COVID-19 task force to, uh, to monitor transactions, to protect consumers uh, from fraud even more um uh than we did and than we did before and so in that sense that is one uh, specific area the other specific area is with so many people now in our uh, workforce working from home yes. um, we also looked into are there any specifics with uh, uh people working from home are there any any different risks in terms of processes that were previously not performed from home um uh that need to be uh 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 gone through again. Um, one other uh, uh, specific, uh, the third parties that work for us. Uh, so we were also, uh, uh, by the way, and the ECB is on top of this uh, uh, as well. We were, we were specifically focusing on the third party risk. Who okay. is now under risk? Who is not? Um, okay. well, and so so let, let, let me interrupt you there because because we, we we're very tight on time. But um, I think it's very interesting, you know, what you raised. You know, cyber risk. You know, new branding of you know the old old, old <laughs> methods, uh, working from home and third parties. All very important things. Well, let's move on now to the last part of the discussion, uh, which is about technology transformation and the designing of state of the art payment hubs. And, and let me come to you, Etienne. I mean, how much do you think that uh, uh, this whole COVID-19 thing has has pushed the technology transformation on, or, or what's your sort of perception of you know of, of how the digital revolution uh, is moving in banking and, and where we are with it? Yeah, I don't think COVID-19 has uh, changed the the push for innovation. I think what it has pushed is the use of innovative uh, means of payment and uh, channels, as was uh, explained earlier. Whether it's a uh, uh, contactless or mobile or wearable uh, uh, payments, but um, I think it, this is not COVID-19 pushing innovation, it's uh, spurring the use of innovative <laughs> yeah. And as far as, um, um, I mean, do we see uh, more innovation in, in, in Europe? I think we have a lot of innovation in Europe. Do we see pan-European innovation? That's the question. I think that's where Mark was right, uh, pressing the lack of uh, of uh, regulatory uh, uh, harmony and the the difference in uh, the way regulators uh, interpret and apply regulation, and of course innovation I think starts at local level, not at European level. It's absolutely uh, normal. Uh, that's yeah. the normal process. And the question is actually, uh, you you cannot stop innovation. You uh, we shouldn't stop innovation. And the trick is actually when do you need to harmonize emerging uh, things in payments. Uh, and uh, how and uh, exactly what and that's really what is difficult and of course we shouldn't forget that we live in a global world and that there are yeah. global standards so Europe is not an island uh, but nevertheless uh, okay. in order to have truly European innovation uh, all right. so, so all, all roads lead back to harmonization I think there um, Mark if I can come back to you because uh, now we're talking about technology transformation you know, I mean, ING has had a real reputation as being uh, a leader in technology transformation and digital payments and the plat whole platform banking uh, uh, aspect. Um, but has the pandemic, has that changed how you're approaching technology at all? Uh, or is it, is it, you know, is, is it the same strategy or have you actually had to change the strategy? No, oh, actually, the strategy has not so much uh, changed, uh, but it's clear that COVID-19 is actually speeding up the already planned roadmaps, uh, specifically for uh, digitalization, uh, with the majority of our clients now completely uh, contacting us and, 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 and acting with us on a digital way. These type of customer journeys need to be really outstanding and scaled up. So that is, I think, the main uh, uh, thing with regard to uh, our technology and 
and and the reason one of the biggest things that we talked about changes uh, that we see in 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 technology and cyber etc but a major change i think has been that our client behavior has changed the acceptance of doing things digitally from a distance that has changed and that is actually causing uh faster us moving faster than originally planned okay all right christoph let, let, let me take this whole issue of technology transformation to you i mean clearly two trends that we've seen um before the pandemic and probably uh increased by the pandemic have been um uh, the challenge of banks making inroads into the payments industry especially in terms of innovation and consumers becoming more comfortable and expecting the highest standards of technology and being able to do everything digitally. Uh, I mean, how do you think banks should be responding to those two trends? No, yeah, no, there is a, a number of factors uh, forcing banks to accelerate, as uh, Mark was rightly saying, uh, accelerate their transformation. I was surprised by a few numbers uh, in our uh, surveys and interviews for, for the report, and, and the reader can find details, but 79% of the banks we interviewed said the first top priority was to become uh, digital masters, huh? uh, re, uh, reinventing uh, their, uh, their offerings in a digital mode. Also, 68% uh, were considering that not transforming their back end, their payment back end, would put their client relationship at, at risk. I see Mark agrees with that. Huh? 68% is everybody, uh, and 50% mentioned legacy infrastructure. So we see more and more demand from banks to uh, uh, transform both what is visible from the client, but also what is invisible uh, because it's part of the end-to-end uh, -end right. delivery and it's critical uh, for success. Now, that's very interesting. On, on the whole back-end issue, I mean, I mean, banks used to be really nervous about doing anything with sort of major, major infrastructure or core banking systems. But clearly what we have seen in recent years is the arrival of a lot of new technology, sort of plug and play technology uh, that allows them to take some of these steps with a lot less risk. I mean, is that also a factor in, in determining how they plan their technology transformation? Sure, there are changes in technologies, there are changes in methodologies also. also huh? We are talking about Agile and more and more doing payment projects in Agile mode when it was a, a rather an area for V-Cycles. Uh, we see also more and more collaboration with, uh, with FinTech, with innovative bodies. Uh, so stakeholders do not reinvent what is already uh, available and can be plugged in. So open architecture, leveraging uh, partners, subcontractors, fintech uh, is now in the uh, in the in the mindset of uh, all uh, CTOs and uh, payment transformers. Okay, Christoph, we're 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 kind of running out of time now. So uh, let me just uh, thank thank everybody and thanks to our online viewers. Uh, we hope you found the discussions to be insightful and gained a number of practical insights. And if you want to arrange a customized World Payments Report presentation for your team or schedule a virtual meeting with Capgemini, please reach out to the team at payments at capgemini.com. That's payments at capgemini.com. And uh, we also encourage you to visit the World Payments Report 2020 website, which includes dynamic graphs on non-cash transactions worldwide, a detailed presentation of the report key highlights, and much, much more. So I'd like to thank again the panel. I mean, uh, I think you went through all the topics uh, wonderfully there. We got some really good insights. And uh, everybody, please enjoy your online Cybos, and hopefully next year we'll be back and be able to see you in person. Thank you very much, panel. Thank you very much, Thank audience. you, Brian. Thank, thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. All right.